ensuring that um, all the, the blockchain related uh, services that FIFA will build were, are going to be built on uh, Algorand or at least uh, the next three years. I mean, that, that, that is going to be big, right? In a way that all football related blockchain will be somehow then have incentive to build in Algorand. Yeah, so this is uh, huge for for the Algorand ecosystem uh, because FIFA is a very uh, huge organization, so a very uh, wide uh, organization, global one. So uh, I think that if you count all the people that uh, under the reach of their activities is uh, bigger than a nation state. So. Uh, Soccer fans uh, together are almost like uh, billions, billions of people. So uh, they needed a real infrastructure that scale up. Uh, so this is why they end up choosing the uh, Algorand. So it's really big for Algorand, and uh, this could potentially turn Algorand into the homeland of sport-related blockchain application. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm just feeling like that definitely opens up a new, new territory that I haven't told because then suddenly, like you know, the sport world is basically just the whole world, right? So, in particular, yeah. football starting in football is kind of a big deal. Yeah, uh, just one second. I'll be back in one second. Sure. Okay, are you back? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So then I think we can start and then um, others could join as they come in. Okay, so really thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Cosimo, uh, for being willing. I think we have, we had conversation um, already and you know, Algorand is also, um, working with us, not only just Cosimo first um, was willing to help us, to help us in this effort in terms of designing our challenge as well. And we had a number of conversations that were really fruitful and we already know what to do. And there are three parts we thought for this batch that Cosimo would, are, is willing to help. And the first part is of course, giving two introductory, one, this, the first talk, and then the next one will be a little bit more hands-on tutorial, and then we go into the challenge, right? So th this would introduce us a lot more to Algorand as well as also the blockchain in general. So the, the, this uh, first uh, talk series will be on introduction and it will be 1.5, uh, so one hour and 30 minutes because the concepts that have acquired are quite a lot. So I think we needed to, to get something like, you know, to start with, uh, with that. And so again, Cosimo, really thank you for your help. And Cosimo has, is a solution architect in Algorand. And what that means, you can ask him also, as, because I didn't know that much when I talked first with Cosimo about what really they were doing and a lot of exciting things. But he's also, I think, you know, in his LinkedIn, actually, that uh, rightly said it's automation, energy transition and blockchain. I think that probably, in my opinion, describes you well, really, really well, because your experience in the energy sector is also very vast, uh, in particular in this automation and, and kind of like supervising some of these energy related things. And I think I'm not, especially blockchain being at least the first blockchain, um, you know, Bitcoin has been so much touted to be uh, against climate and a lot more energy intensive. 
and I assume that really gives you also an advantage to you know to be able to see uh, and maybe play with that one. So it's really there is a, a lot of and I also saw that from your LinkedIn actually you had already an experience in uh, assisting trainees like I think in Turin right um, you had already you were already helping uh, there and so and your willingness to help here and you knew like you have at least introduced to the academy and these are people hungry uh, who really want to make a dent in the world and particular in the african uh, participation in 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 crypto and in blockchain in general and you know the future of um, whatever the future let's say like uh, it could be you know blockchain will be probably everywhere um, from finance to our games to probably how we're gonna run our companies and maybe even governments right so there's a lot of potential there and then and being able to be the first for us to help us in that direction we really take it very serious and appreciate um you know your your effort so with that then let me just give you the floor so that you can start your introduction uh tutorial uh, your, your introduction talk Augusto. thanks yeah thanks for seeing yeah so thanks for the introduction and uh, presentation i'm very happy to be here today talking to you guys i hope this uh, could uh, facilitate your learning curve in uh, blockchain and web3 and as we are going to uh, see today understand first of all what the blockchain is why not all blockchain are equal it's really important why not all the blockchain are at odds with uh, with the uh, the climate sustainability uh, is important. So let me uh, first of all share uh, the the screen, and then uh, so just just to ask, are you happy if people kind of send questions uh, along your talk, or do you want it to answer at the end? Just uh, um, how do you prefer it? So I maybe it's better to postpone all the questions to the end because this. Okay. Do not break the the the, the reasoning sure. uh, path maybe and make yeah. easier for who are going to follow after the registration to have a a full uh, maybe explanation first. Yeah, but happy to to take any question you guys have. Yeah, so I think uh, what we would do is exactly just like people can type their question and I'll summarize at you know once you 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 reach a certain level. Uh, we can then you can try to answer those questions once you finish like the full stream. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So let me let me share the screen. Uh, I think you should see another presentation, right? Yes, we do. Okay. So wonderful. So uh, this presentation uh, is called Algorand School. It's a deck that I've built over time uh, doing some tools uh, and it's a pretty comprehensive deck. It's open source. You can find everything on my GitHub and I'm committed in the, the uh, bringing, uh, keeping this up to date over time. Uh, it's not easy because the technology evolves so fast, but uh, people that are interested to download it are uh, free to go on uh, my GitHub and uh, Kuzma uh, Algorand School and download it. Okay, so our journey today, and maybe the next uh, time too, uh, is understanding how Algorand consensus work, what is an Algorand network, how to use Algorand development tools, and how to develop decentralized application on the Algorand virtual machine. Uh, the path will follow this agenda is a pretty big agenda. No, we are not going to cover everything here because we have no time. So I will extract the basic information. But first of all, uh, we are going to understand what is a blockchain infrastructure, uh, what is the consensus, why algorithm is sustainable, and what is an algorithm network. Then in the other session, we are going to focus on more technical things like uh, deep technical, I mean, maybe example of code, transaction, what is an account, what is the algorithm, virtual machine, uh, and so on. Because these are all the tools that you are going to need as a web-free uh, software engineer 
and to deal with sort of contracts, token, integration of API of a network, uh, and we are going to see everything together. So first of all, what is a blockchain? Uh, and let's try to understand these uh, looking at the blockchain as an infrastructure. So an infrastructure, an infrastructure for digital native value. So first of all, the blockchain is a digital infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I like to start quoting uh, Eric Smith that said that the ability to create something which is really not duplicable in a digital world as an enormous value. Why? So, first of all, what is an infrastructure and why should we ask ourselves questions, reasoning about infrastructure? Infrastructure uh, as uh, to be defined in infrastructure should, should solve this trilemma. So, first of all, if we think of a road as an infrastructure, we want this road to be secure. So I don't want that the bridge fall down while I'm crossing the bridge or the people that drive on the road are lying like crazy. So I'm, it's dangerous. We don't want to that, to that property for an infrastructure. We want an infrastructure to be secure. Uh, second, an infrastructure, an infrastructure should be, should be accessible to everybody. Uh, otherwise it's just a private property. This is not an infrastructure. So, if someone can shut down, uh, for example, a, a piping system at uh, his will, this is not really an infrastructure because we are at all stage of personal wills. And if the infrastructure is not efficient in doing and uh, accomplishing the task, it could not be a good infrastructure. For example, the electrical grid should consume very, very small amount of energy to transfer the energy. Uh, otherwise, will waste more power than delivered. So it will make no sense. So all the infrastructure have this kind of problem and we are gonna understand uh, in a minute or some after some uh, reasoning why the blockchain should be considered uh, under this question. So who should be public, private, who has the control, what the use and responsibility in the infrastructure and what are the incentives for the people to cooperate to make such an infrastructure reach this property. So the problem of the native digital value is that in the, in the digital, digital age, everything can be represented as bits, so a string of zero and one. And this is very, very uh, useful because we can transfer information. The problem is, the, is that strings of zero and one are useful, uh, but you can also duplicate them easily. So the value is difficult to represent in a digital age with just digital things because we need to talk about value, some properties like scarcity, authenticity, and unicity. And this is uh, uh, something hard in the digital world. So this was the context. So how can we build such uh, an infrastructure? And the answer is a protocol. And we are going to understand why soon. This problem, so uh, having native representation of digital value is not just an information technology problem, it's something more. We need at the same time distributed system, cryptography, again theory, combined together in creating what, uh, what we call a public tamper-proof and transparent trustless ledger. This seems very complicated, but, but I hope that we are going to understand what does it mean soon. So distributed system and cryptography alone can solve the information problem, as, for example, we have done in the TCP IP infrastructure for the internet, communication protocols, we can exchange uh, information in a distributed way with uh, the security of cryptography. The addition of the game theory is something different. We are starting to understand here that in order to this infrastructure work, we need value, we need uh, game theory, we need incentives and alignment. Otherwise, this new kind of protocol cannot work. So for if, if there's no value there, this thing, this machine simply not work. 
So the distribution is important because uh, no one should have the absolute power at single point of failure in this infrastructure. So the, the answer is who controls the system? Who controls the blockchain? The answer should, the, the question is who controls? And the answer should be nobody, but everybody. So the past uh, of the uh, past uh, examples of networks are were heavily centralized, and we are going to progress toward a future that distribute this kind of networks, uh, so that we can solve part of that trilemma. Uh, the cryptography is needed because uh, since we have value on this infrastructure, uh, nobody should be able to break the rules. And everybody should be able to verify in an easy way that what is written on this ledger on this infrastructure is really, really true. And cryptography uh, works uh, and uh, help us on that. And the other thing is we should have uh, in this picture uh, a way to align the incentives of the uh, collectivity that participate in this infrastructure because we need to find a way in which attacking those systems is less convenient than protecting them. And in other words, we are going to uh, find a way to turn an attack into a costly thing. So the cost of the attack make malicious behaviors very expensive in this infrastructure. And this is crucial to protect the world system. Okay, so we understood that these digital things uh, cannot uh, have properties that are common in the analog world, in the physical world, in which we have the law of physics acting. And, but why I'm talking about law of physics for something that is uh, digital? This is something that is counterintuitive. But let's try to understand uh, from the beginning what a blockchain is. So a blockchain is a public ledger of transactional data. And uh, here we have an example of very ancient ledger. So since the first uh, writing system, uh, uh, written documents like this were, uh, has been used to trace who owns what. And this is a powerful thing uh, if we can have a ledger that records who is mine and what is yours. But in the blockchain, as we said, uh, this not should be in the hand of a single uh, entity. So it's better to create multiple copy of this ledger. So we have a ledger, uh, blockchain is a ledger, but there is there are multiple copies of this ledger among these uh, distributed networks. So the copies are distributed and replicated among several nodes that are part of this network. Now, every node is a ledger keeper and those all the ledger keepers should work together with the same set of rules. So everybody play the same game and we should verify that anything that wants to be added into this ledger has been verified according to some rules common to everybody so that we reach an understanding and a consensus of the fact that this transaction now can be added to all the copy of this ledger in the ecosystem. And so why I talked about uh, physical properties like this metaphor? Uh, let me explain why. So uh, on the left, you have the image about the digital world and on the right, the image that speaks about the physical world. So in the digital world, bits can be copy and paste easily and are not obliged to follow the arrow of time. What does it mean? So let's uh, think about in a system in a state A, that transition to a, a new system state B, and then come back to original state A. So A, B, A. It's very difficult if you just look at the two states A and A to, un, to 
to understand who comes first, who comes after. So having a unique direction of time, just looking on digital snapshot could be different, could be difficult, sorry. While on the, on the, uh, in the analog world and physical world, atoms cannot be copy and paste as we, as we uh, wish. Could, will be very, very cool if I can take a, a, a bunch of stuff and just replicate them as a, as a, as a light, like Emilio Ferrari, for example. We cannot do that. And atoms, since are uh, acting according to the law of physics, uh, uh, the, the, the arrow of time just process in one way. We can say, thanks to the law of physics, that what comes first, what comes after, and we, we cannot revert the, we cannot go back in the past. We cannot reverse what the things that happened in the past. So history is uh, something that turned out out of physics. Okay, history has a unique direction of time. So what we would like to have is taking the property on the right and having those property in the in a digital world. This is hard. So this is why we talk about a blockchain. So we have two concepts. We have the concept of block and we have the concept of chain. The block, the concept of block refers to a, an entity, a set of transactions that are proposed and verified by the other nodes and eventually added to the ledger. So this, uh, ensures that nobody can just copy and paste data, remove data, or uh, write data as they like. Data are organized in block, and block follows some very, very strict verification rules. And the concept of chain is that, uh, refers to the fact that each block uh, of transaction contains a proof, so a cryptographical hash, of what was in the previous block. And these uh, um, allow us to talk about the arrow of time in this ledger. This ledger has a very, very clear historical hierarchy of what comes first and what comes after. Uh, and so we have these two properties that we are the property that we are really interested in. So no copy and paste or modification information, arbitrary information, and Storicization of information. And uh, we can think about a blockchain, so a distributed system, by comparing, again, the digital world to the physical world. On the right, in the physical world, a system like a machine, you have a, an example here of a very simple system, a piston. It is a machine. Uh, the evolution of the state of this system is uh, determined by the inviolable law of physics, and the system is described here with two variables, pressure and volume. So you have some atoms, you have the law of physics, and the system goes from state to another state according to some rules. Now, on the left side, we have another kind of machine. So we can think a blockchain not just as a ledger. We we can think uh, uh, to uh, uh, a blockchain like a distributed state machine. So a machine that has some state that says what is uh, belonging to Cosimo, what is belonging to Musa, what is belonging to other people, and then after some transaction con contained in a block, we have a new state. Now, the, the problem is uh, we have no law of physics and the question is the evolution of the state of the system is determined by what? What is acting on the bits to ensure that the next state is a valid state? And the answer is uh, we have software rules. So if the question is, how should we replace the role that played by the law of physics in the evolving uh, machine, the answer is we need a set of 
software rules that we call a consensus protocol that evolves the state of the system. So here in, in, in the photo, you have Margaret Hamilton, that maybe is one of the women that define the concept of software engineering. And here in the photo, you see that that, that uh, stack of paper is really the source code uh, of uh, the Apollo uh, mission. So the handwritten uh, source code needed to uh, 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 control the Apollo mission. And Margaret Hamilton has a very, very um, important responsibility here, which is adding new piece of consistent software, uh, ensuring that the new piece of software uh, she write is uh, consistent, has no errors, and so on and so forth. So I use this metaphor uh, to say that if you think about this piece of code, like uh, information in a block, the responsibility to add a new block on the system is given to what we call the block proposer. So the block proposer has the responsibility to add a new piece of consistent information in the system that respects the rule. So since the Genesis block until the, the latest block, those rules must be enforced by someone. And the problem is that the real problem, the, the real hard question in, in, uh, in the blockchain system is who choose the block proposer? So who says that it's going to be me or someone else to propose the new set of information? This is the real question and the hard part to, to solve in, the, in, in this kind of system. So who is going to say that Margaret Hamilton should add the new block? And the answer is that uh, we need a protocol, and this protocol must respect these four points. So, first one, who will choose the proposal for the next block if this infrastructure is public and permissionless? So, there is no ad admin, there is no special uh, role in the in the system that say okay you are allowed to do that you are not allowed to do that every everybody can participate so we we need some rule how to choose the that the next block so that there is no ambiguity in the in the choice of the block so if we said that this information is really really uh, powerful and valuable i do not want to be in a system in which uh, part of the system says that uh, pi is 3.14, another part of the system that say that, that pi is uh, 1100. Okay, so we want to see the same reality and the same truth, everybody. That this brings to the other point. So ensuring that this blockchain stays unique over time, has no force. So, uh, there could not be the possibility that two people together propose the same block at the same height so that we have a fork. And the other thing to ensure is that since this system is like an organism, we should have the consensus rules set so that they can evolve themselves. So software can evolve everything can evolve over time in life. So we can have also one feature of the consensus protocol is auto evolving itself. Uh, here on the right, you have the image uh, that I choose to represent those concepts, which is the uh, temple of Concordia in Agrigento. is a very, very ancient and beautiful temple that has been entitled to the goddess of Concordia, which is the goddess that in the uh, Roman uh, mythology and Greek mythology after uh, uh, first and after in the Roman one, uh, represented the social harmony. So the agreement that we live in a common society under 
this is the very inspiring and powerful symbol. That's why I choose this uh, representation. So how to ensure that? Historically, uh, when the first idea about blockchain came around, uh, the answer to those questions is, okay, the protocol that we are going to use is a proof of work mechanism. A proof of work mechanism say to uh, uh, answer uh, to the question who is going to propose the next block in this way. We have all the uh, nodes that we can call it that miners that compete one against each other to uh, append the new block. So they compete one against each other to speak to the network, to have the possibility to speak to everybody. And earn something in uh, reward for that. This fight that they conduct is a computational fight. So they really have a computational battle in which they waste a lot of energy and uh, computational capacity to solve a riddle. And the higher is the power that you burn, the higher is the probability that you are going to solve the riddle. And the problem with this approach uh, is that it's not very scalable, has really huge electrical consumption and concentrates the power of being a block proposer in very few hands that are the hands of this mine farm, which are very, very huge industrial complex today uh, with wreck of uh, thousands of uh, hardware pieces that compute this uh, this riddle and this kind of uh, proof of work has also another problem which uh, 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 which is is not uh, free from soft forking so in proof of work from time to time you can have multiple proposal in the same time this is uh, why uh, for example in proof of work uh, uh, blockchain Usually, uh, they ask you to wait for six or seven blocks before being sure that your transaction has been finalized. And what came uh, after to try to solve this uh, uh, scalability problem and uh, efficiency problem was a concept uh, that has been called proof of stake consensus mechanism. So in this proof of stake, uh, the, the, uh, to the question, okay, who is gonna uh, have the right to speak and have the next block? The answer is that the network participant now, instead of showing commitment through wasting energy, they show their commitment and interest to, in keeping this ledger safe by providing a proof that they own value on that ledger itself. So, would be not rational to uh, attack the system on which I own my value, okay? Because I, if my value is there, I, have, I am more incentivized in, in protecting the system. And the higher is the skin in the game that I have in, on the ledger, the higher is the probability of being elected as a pro board proposer. So the problem was, that this kind of proof of stake has been implemented uh, historically in two ways. One is what we call bonded proof of stake, so that validators must commit some stake, lock the stake uh, to be admitted in, among the validators. Um, and the problem with this approach is, first of all, participating in this kind of consensus makes the protocols um, makes the stake not liquid because you lock this stake. And the other fact is that uh, there could be an economical barrier to the entry to this system because not everybody can afford to lock a reasonable amount of value just for the sake of validating a blockchain. So uh, asking to put there uh, a barrier of entrance in economical terms makes this uh, kind of consensus protocol harder to decentralize. 
And the other, uh, in another kind of uh, proposal that came after was the delegated proof of stake, in which you say, okay, if you cannot put all that stake, but you have minor stake, then uh, just delegate your fraction to someone else so that together this uh, grouped node can uh, participate. The problem is that, first of all, this is centralized by by design uh, because you have few huge nodes delegated nodes that hacked on the system and the second is that this has some risks because if you have few nodes few delegated nodes that are well established and known to everybody in the system this is like uh, for an attacker this is like uh, playing battleship knowing in advance the coordinate of the adversary. So I really, it's really easy for, a, for an adversary to target the, the nodes with, a, for example, denial, distributed denial of service. So this problem, this, this approach had some problem. And the question to, uh, to go back to the principle is, okay, we have an infrastructure and as, infra as an infrastructure, we have a trilemma that is what we call the blockchain trilemma, but it's really an infrastructure trilemma. And it says, uh, could a blockchain be at the same time secure, scalable, and decentralized? And the answer that Aldern has is yes. And the uh, answer is a technological answer. And the name of this technological answer is pure proof of stake, which is the consensus mechanism that has been designed by Silvio Vicali, which is one of the father of the modern cryptography. Silvio is the founder, the Algorand founder, is a professor to the MIT, uh, is a Turing Award, which means that it's like a Nobel Prize in computer science. And he has been, he has spent his whole life working on cryptography. Uh, and distributed system and is also the father to modern primitives that are today used in all the protocols, uh, blockchain, internet, like zero-knowledge proof, probabilistic encryption, digital signatures, and so on and so forth. But okay, what are the properties of Algorand? Algorand is scalable, yes, can scale to billion of users. Algorand is efficient, Yes, because can process thousands of transactions per second, and we are going to improve this by an order of magnitude in this year. Is it fast? Yes, you can finalize a block in less, uh, uh, in less than five seconds. Uh, as econo is it economically viable? Yes, because you have very, very low fee, just 0.001 algo per transaction. As no forks, so the probability of forking Algorand is uh, less than 10 to the minus 18. What does it mean? It means that suppose a block, so since the 10 to the 18 is the order of magnitude of the seconds in the life of the universe, if this blockchain uh, will be able to generate one block per second, you should wait the age of the universe to see a four in Algorand which is for us very unlikely to happen. So it's, we have no soft ports. Uh, Algorand has an instant transaction finality, which means that um, as soon as the block is proposed on the network, this, this block is really final. You should not wait any other uh, blocks, like in proof of work, in which you have to wait six or seven blocks. The hardware requirements to participate in, an, in as a node are very, very low. There is no delegation and no binding of the stake. There is no minimum stake and the infrastructure is carbon negative. And we are going to understand why after. And so this means that you have no barrier so that the pure proof of stake lowers all the barrier to the entrance and the participation to the consensus protocol which means that nobody can say, no, I cannot participate because we, we, we ensure that almost everybody 
with the minimum hardware and minimum stake, uh, no minimum stake, sorry, can really participate in the consensus. So how it works? Why is it possible to reach these properties? Remember that the problem here is elect, electing the block proposer in a permissionless uh, and public system. So the answer to the problem for Algorand is we use this proof of stake. So imagine this coin is an algo in your stake. And we use uh, for each algo this concept that we call VRF, which, which stands for verifiable random function, which is a, crypto a cryptographical primitive invented by Silvio Michalo. Uh, the, the usage of the verifiable random function allows us to think about this algorand coin like a dice. So imagine to have uh, it, that if you own some algo, you own some dice. You have some dice, and those dice are perfectly balanced and are really equiproperable. So nobody can tamper with the result. So. You, by no means, uh, you can make the phase number six more probable than the phase number four. Then these dice, these, uh, these magic, magical cryptographical dice, um, have other nice property, like observing these dice rule, you have no possibility to increase the chance of guessing the next result. So you do not learn anything by looking at this randomness. And each dice is unique and uh, is uh, recognizable uh, because it's signed by its owner. So if I roll a dice, you will see a, a signature on, on the dice that says that this dice belongs to Cosimo. And nobody can roll those dice on my behalf. And the result, or a dice roll is publicly verifiable. So as soon as I launch the I, I launch the, the dice, everybody in the network can verify that yes, Cosimo obtained the number six in this block. And how uh, uh, we use this uh, mechanism, how we use this verifiable random function can that gives this magical property in the protocol. The, the usage is each user has some algo, which are magical dices, and um, for each new block, so for each new round of the blockchain, uh, everybody is able to launch the dice in a distributed parallel and secret manner. So which means that the, the dice are rolled in my artwork and nobody see that. But once I have uh, seen that my result is the winning result, I can speak on the network and I can say my uh, word on the next block. Uh, and this is very, very powerful. So we use this mechanism and uh, I'm going to simplify this uh, mechanism here uh so imagine that uh to each algo uh is associated associated a couple of private and public key so the public key is the key that everybody can see and the private key is the key that i should not reveal to anyone for each round of the the blockchain there is a threshold that is a number for example, let's say 42. Each algo that performs a, a VRF generates two information. One is the pseudo-random uh, pseudo number, which is the number that you generate with really, really uh, low hardware. And then a proof that everybody can use to verify that in that round, what exactly Cosimo with these dice to have obtained some result. These allow us to elect someone that wins 
the uh, these cryptographical lotteries, these cryptographical dice roll, uh, so that if your result is lower than the threshold, you win. If your result is higher than the threshold, you lose. And we repeat this uh, mechanism in three steps. So first of all, the first dice roll elect someone among the system that can propose a block. And then we repeat this cryptographical lottery again to elect a group of thousand people that verifies my proposal. So that, for example, if I uh, propose a block, this committee of thousand verifier ensure that in this block, for example, I'm not proposing a transaction that is overspending. So if I say that in this block there is a transaction that says that 10 algo were sent from Cosimo to someone else, Cosimo owned at least 10 algo in that time. So there is no overspending and all the rules that we want to enforce. So we elect a block proposer, we propose a block, we elect a, a committee of thousand verifier. If they together reach a consensus, a core, they certify a block and they append this block to the, to the ledger. So the question is, okay, but how long does it take? And it's really, really fast. It, all this process takes just 4.5 seconds globally to happen. So each 4.5 4 seconds, we generate a new block. Uh, is this secure? Yes. Why is this secure? Because in Algorand, this lottery happens in parallel on your own hardware. So if I am an adversary, I uh, cannot know who should be the target of my attack because the, I, I don't know who I should attack because the, these dice roll happen in, your, in the privacy of your hardware. And once you reveal yourself on the network saying, okay, I am the winner and this is the block that I propose, it's too late to attack you because you already proposed the block that you wanted to propose. So in Algorand, it's very hard for an attacker to target the block proposer because it's unknown until he reveals himself with the proposal. And this is the output of this very huge and distributed ledger and machine. So up to March 2022, Algorand uh, generated over 20 million blocks with zero downtime. Uh, the ledger has, has grown up to one ter uh, terabyte. Uh, we have more than 23 million address with an average of two or three monthly active addresses. And with an average of block finalization that for 20 million blocks has been around 4.5 seconds with minor statistical deviation from this number. So it's a very, very consistent average. And uh, we uh, experience uh, volume, peak, uh, a weekly peak of volume of over 1,000 transactions per second. So the infrastructure does what has been designed for. So, okay, what you have on this ledger? So, Algorand is a layer one. Algorand is a distributed machine. What can you accomplish on this very efficient and powerful ledger? You have different possibilities and you have different capabilities. So, for example, one is the Algorand Standard Asset Framework, which means that on Algorand, you can easily tokenize things like security, currencies, stable coin, loyalty point, utility tokens, real fraction, real estate fraction, or even the page that attests the fact that you accomplished this course. Everything that can be turned into a token, which represents a digital ownership of something that is not double spendable and not overspendable can be accomplished on Algorand easily. And the fact that this framework is at, as layer, at layer one 
means that this is a first class object, which means that you have the same speed, security, and cost of all the layer one. Uh, token are not a feature on top of it, are a feature of the funding, the foundational technology. Then you have this other very powerful tool uh, that we call Algorand Virtual Machine. The Algorand Virtual Machine is an execution environment built on top of the distributed system that executes applications that are commonly known as a smart contract, uh, which are programs that enforce the rule of the game and are executed uh, really uh, in a distributed and, and secure way. You have then Aldra State Proof. Uh, I'm not spending uh, so much time on this, but State Proof is a way on which you can generate a, a snapshot of the state of the system uh, to make Algorand interoperable with other blockchains uh, in a post quantum secure way. So Algorand is securing in, uh, itself, its state with post-quantum secure techniques of cryptography so that a future attacker, quantum attacker, will not be able in the, in, in the, in the future to mess with the past in the, in the Algorand blockchain. And the atomic transfer are a very, very powerful way to organize multi-party multi transaction uh, among people or among people and machines so, for example, user and smart contract, so that, for example, if you have very, very complicated transaction, like I want to sell a piece of real estate, if and only if you pay someone else, if and only if some other condition are met on the uh, on a smart contract, you bind every condition, everything together, and these conditions are going to be approved altogether or rejected altogether. This means that you can orchestrate very complex um, interaction on Algorand with zero counterparty risk. So what does it mean that the execution happen on, on, uh, on layer one? Uh, blockchain as other complex system have a natural heartbeat. So for example, the, the electrical grid has a frequency that is uh, 50 Hertz here in Europe, 60 Hertz in Brazil, and so on. Or uh, human beings have uh, the heartbeat. So this clock of the system. In, in the blockchain, the clock of the system is the block time. So the, every 4.5 seconds, this system must accomplish all, all the operation to verify the block. The, the, on Algorand, uh, the thing, uh, uh, saying that everything happened on layer one means that token, atomic transfer, or even the Algorand virtual machine execution do not slow down the world blocks production. So no matter what happens, Algorand is, uh, is going to generate uh, a block each and every point for uh, 4.5 seconds, regardless of the fact that in the block you have just uh, transa normal transaction or smart contract execution. And okay, we basically answered uh, the, the, this question what does the execution layer one mean? And now I would like to add some uh, words on the sustainability of this whole system, because in our uh, view, being permissionless as a system uh, does not mean being responsibility-less with respect to the environment in which we operate, okay? We cannot hide behind the excuse of being permissionless to, not, to give up responsibility over technology. We do not want to do that. So proof of work, uh, like we said, is very, very wasteful. And, and we think that our planet can no longer afford these unsustainable technologies for innovating. Uh, and if we compare as an order of magnitude uh, ourselves against the existing technology, this is more or less 
uh, a matter of really order and order of magnitudes. So, for example, in uh, other blockchains based on proof of work, uh, the average energy consumed for each transaction could be also thousands of kilowatt hours. So, if you put this number as a comparison of the height of some buildings, this will be that Bitcoin is twice the Burj Khalifa, Ethereum is almost the eighth of tower, while Algorand is uh, the paper sheet thickness. But you can say, okay, you like to win easy because you are comparing yourself as a proof of stake blockchain against a proof of work. What about the other proof of stake? And the answer is that when the going gets tough, tough get going. Because if you want to really compare uh, two systems that now are really close uh, with respect to the magnitude uh, of the energy consumption, you should take in, uh, in account the whole system capability to have a fair comparison. Because blockchain sustainability must consider uh, at the same time the scalable end user transaction, the finality of the transaction, node add hardware, so the decentralization and the security of that uh, network. So if you take some input power to power this infrastructure, what you want to compare with against the other is the real useful output, which is end user finalized transaction. Because being sustainable while centralized, not efficient, insecure, not scalable is worthless. So the question is that is Algorand blockchain efficient as consuming energy to finalize and user useful transaction in a secure, scalable, and decentralized way? And the answer is yes, uh, because Algorand transactions are 100% available to end users. Other proof of stake instead consume their own transaction for rich consensus. Algorand transactions are 100% instantly final. So other proof of stake consume the energy of several blocks to finalize transaction in the previous block. Algorand uh, transactions are secured by very decentralized network, while some other proof of stake that claim to be sustainable have just few nodes, which is easy. And uh, Algorand security is a feature of its own efficiency because Algorand never experienced downtime since the Genesis block. Okay, so now uh, we are going to look closely uh, to the Algorand networks and the APIs. So this was the theory part. Now we are going to uh, glimpse the, the technical stuff. So for developers, APIs, uh, and we, this is the part that we are going to um, understand better also in the other uh, future section. So Algorand networks are composed by two kinds of nodes, uh, what we call non-relay nodes and relay nodes. So non-relay nodes uh, are the, or participation node, or light node, if you like, are the nodes that participate in the consensus uh, and are connected to the relays. Uh, those nodes can store all the chain or not, so they can be configured as archival nodes, full node, or just live light nodes. In the light configuration, they store just the latest thousand block and can be synchronized in a very, very time efficient way. In a matter of minutes, you can be synchronized with the network, starting from scratch and speak to everybody. The other uh, kind of node are the relay nodes. Those nodes are really responsible for routing the connection and uh, the message into the system. They act like the communication backbone of the network and their responsibility is finding efficient communication but reducing the hopes that the message 
must have to reach everybody. So, um, given these rules, uh, these, those numbers are uh, quite old, so now we have uh, over uh, and, and 400 uh, participation nodes and uh, more uh, relay nodes than uh, we described here, but this is just uh, a snapshot of uh, the topology of a typical algorithm network. So these nodes here uh, in red uh, are the relay nodes. They, are, uh, they have very robust communication channel between each other. While these pink nodes is just a participation and you see that the participation node speaks only to relays. They do not speak between themselves. So uh, the communication is participation to relay, relay to participation. And the relay can speak to everybody. So this ensures that if I speak to this relay, through gossiping, the message is dispatched to everybody in a very, very uh, low latency manner. So as a developer, uh, the question is, okay, how can I access this network? What I need to start developing and building on, on, on the system? And the answer is that you need two information. One, one is the REST API endpoint, the EP address of the endpoint, and the other is a token to the authentication of the API. So you can uh, ask to, my, uh, to, to me, uh, okay, how do I get those information? And the answer is you can uh, instantiate an algo B client, which is the client uh, uh, of, uh, of an endpoint, uh, in three ways. So the most, the, the classical way is since this is a permissionless blockchain, run your own node. So you can run a node uh, in Linux environment in uh, very, very, with very, very low hardware requirements. And you can have, uh, provide uh, the endpoint and the access token by yourself. So you run the node and you, you self provide to you the endpoint. And once you have the endpoint, all the queries, all the API requests are submitted to your node and the node speaks to the network as we said. The other uh, way to uh, join the Algorand network as a developer is using a third-party service. So there are some public APIs, some public services that give you, give you the possibility to join the Algorand network not running, uh, by not running uh, a node on your, on your own. So if you want just to uh, make some, uh, I don't know, uh, example, uh, some uh, work uh, uh, really quick and dirty maybe, you can use the free APIs that are available, or maybe if you want to run a business uh, in production, but uh, you want to uh, read from the duty of maintaining the nodes, you can maybe have um, a paid uh, version of their API. So this is like a business or a free way to uh, access with the low volume to the algorithm network. There is another uh, very interesting way to uh, interact with algorithm networks uh, for a developer, which is uh, the sandbox. The sandbox is a Docker container. I don't know if you are familiar with Docker technology, but it's like a, a really, really small standard virtual machine that has inside a micro algorithm network. Uh, with one, just one node. So your, your own node, your own consensus. So there is nobody there, but there is everything that runs on algorithm. So the algorithm virtual machine, the token, everything. And you can just experiment by using uh, these nodes, these, uh, these micro networks to develop your own uh, skills, debug your application before switching to public networks 
in future. So it's very, very useful in uh, development stage. The, the main networks uh, are three main networks. We have the testnet, the mainnet, and the beta. So the mainnet is the original network. So the, the real network that has value, which is, that, that is capitalized, in which the algo has real value. The testnet uh, is almost like a twin of the mainnet, in the sense that they, these two networks are always aligned with respect to the consensus protocol. So if you deploy something in the testnet, you know that in the mainnet you will have the same uh, consensus protocol, so no differences, so it's very repeatable as employment. And you have free resources, which means that if you want to acquire a, a, a set of algo to do some test transaction, it's free on the testnet. The badnet is like a testnet in the sense that it's free, but runs a future version of the protocol. So if you, you want to test in advance some feature that has been released as a new upgrade of the protocol, you can do that on Betanet, start working that there, and then switching to test and mainnet. Uh, private networks are the networks inside that Docker container. So the private networks that you can manage just to run your own software development and debug, and then deploy on. Uh, on uh, on the networks. Okay, so to run uh, uh, an algorithm node, uh, what you need is first of all the genesis block of the network with which you want to be synchronized. So there is a genesis block that generated the beta net, a genesis block from which the test net was generated, another genesis block from which the main net started. You need to choose the very first initial piece of information to synchronize with the network. And you can install a node on Linux, on macOS, on Windows, although Linux and macOS are the official distribution of the node. You can choose the network, like for example, I want to start with the testnet. And what you need to do is start in your node and synchronize your node. What does it mean? So imagine that we talked about this state, this distributed machine evolves over time. So if you just look at the Genesis block, because you arrived today as, as a new user of the network, you have a gap with respect to the other people that are millions of blocks ahead of you. It's like uh, you join the universe in the Big Bang, uh and and then the whole history must happen before uh you are able to get here in 2022 so if you want to reconstruct all the history by yourself because you can you are really really uh, a maximalist of decentralization you do not trust anybody you want to verify everything that happened historically until today by yourself you can do that, takes time, takes roughly two weeks, maybe today, to re-verify everything from the Genesis block, you can do that. And once you accomplish this procedure, you know the state of the system, but you know that the state of the system is not being told by someone that in the street they said, okay, this is the state of the system. You verified that this was the only state, the only possible state. Uh, if you have no time and you can admit uh, some degree of trust in the others, uh, there are some fast catch-up checkpoints, that are cryptographical checkpoints that let you jump in the, in the time, in the history of time. So, for example, if you trust me, I can say this is a checkpoint uh, that lets you jump to the block 20 million. If you accept it, you can start from there. And this procedure is called fast catch up. So once you are synchronized, you can start interact with the algorithm network and you have basically three ways to interact with the network. First one is the command line utility of the node. So the node has a command line 
uh, and is useful, for example, to start experimenting just the first transaction and so on and so forth. Then the node expose also a REST API uh, that can be called like any other REST API uh, with the HTTP uh, requests. Or you can use the Algorand SDKs. The Algorand SDKs are really a wrapper around the REST API that abstract the API, making possible to you to write application code, Algorand application code in one of these uh, languages. And we are going to uh, have a and more, more an idea on that. So this was the node. Another component that uh, it uh, goes, let me say, hand in hand with, with node is the algorithm indexer. Because with the node, you can see the state and write on the ledger. Uh, so uh, uh, sending transaction. With the indexer, uh, you uh, do the other part of the job that is reading information from the ledger. So here on the right, you have the, the ledger, which is the raw data accumulated over time uh, in blocks by the algorithm blockchain. And then you have this process that parse the, 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 the blocks and index the data in a PostgreSQL database. So that expose that REST API interface so that it's really easy with uh, Python, JavaScript, Java, or Go, or any other language that the community developed to read the state of the system. So for example, if you want to read, let me know all the transaction ever done by Cosimo uh, in uh, this particular Apple or Pineapple token you can easily retrieve those information with the indexer. So the interaction with Algorand, like I said, is done by two main components, the node and the indexer. The key manager is just like a tool to generate little uh, accounts that simulate what in production the user uh, do uh users do usually with a wallet so it's like key manager for developers in production you have wallets uh then these all these uh process have all or an, a common line an api and the and the api like i said has been abstracted in four languages four main languages these main languages are Java, JavaScript, Python, and Go. There are other SDKs built in, uh, by the community like C Sharp, Rust, PHP, or other. The difference is that if you rely on the top four, you know that the documentation, the maintainability, the upgrade are synchronized, are always up to date because the algorithm team and engineering is working on that too it's not just the community these other are just driven by the community so could be synchronized or not depends on the open source contributors so my suggestion is that start using the official one everything that i said and every information that i will share in the other session is written on the algorithm developer portal which is a huge and rich source of information for Algorand. There are some uh, other repositories driven by the community, like uh, Awesome Algorand, which are content and uh, uh, repository of uh, topics related to development, uh, application, that could be useful to have as an example. And then you have other tools like Wallet, because uh, to uh, interact with the blockchain, you will always need to sign a transaction. And the signing of transaction happens in a component that we usually call wallet. So this Yalgrand official wallet that uh, has been rebranded in a Pera wallet, so these slides should be updated. Uh, he used this uh, nice protocol with 
it's, uh, that is called Wallet Connect, it means that your application can generate QR code from uh, on, on the web application so that a user can scan the QR code, see the transaction and accept and send the transaction, or even communicate with deep links from mobile to mobile application so that the, the, the keys are always stored safely in your uh, mobile and you just use the mobile as your key manager and repository. Then we have other components like Pialco Wallet that recalls maybe, I don't know if you ever seen a PayPal pop-up for paying. Uh, the user experience is similar or if you have some experience on Ethereum, the Algorand Signer is a Chrome extension that pops up when you have to sign a transaction on uh, on Chrome. Uh, so we have different components. Then you have the chain explorers that lets you see everything that is happening on chain. And uh, okay, so uh, I will I will pause here uh, so we can have these last few minutes for questions. And, uh, and uh, uh, just just as a preview, uh, the next topics will start with the uh, Algren transaction, and we are going to see properties, JSON, so something that is more uh, related with the implementation. Right. I think this is really wonderful. I think uh, it it goes from you know, all the way from the motivation of the physics and relating to the laws to where we are now, like actually practicality. There's one question from Binium who asked about how exactly is the first block created and what are the basis uh, and what base are blocks in a chain, sequenced or ordered? Uh, and yeah, it's like what follows what? So it's in the text box. Okay, um, the, the, the Genesis block uh, has been uh, uh, created uh, to uh, set in stone the number of algo that could ever exist on the ledger. This is a, uh, this is a fixed number, uh, 10 billion uh, algos will ever be in circulation in, in, in the system. Uh, the, the blocks are sequenced uh, by the uh, consensus protocol. So the block proposed, each and every new block, uh, all the, the, the consensus mechanism that I showed you happens, elect someone that proposed a new block based on the transaction heard and listened in, in, the, in this uh, time frame. And uh, the new block always has the hash of the previous one. So these create the chain and, and, the, and the link. And uh, yeah, the last question was, that means what determines what block follows what block in the chain. So the, the consensus protocol determines the evolution of, uh, of the system in a secure way. Great, Martin. All right, uh, thank you for the uh, very good presentation. Uh, so I had uh, three questions. Uh, so the first question is, how do you uh, handle the issue of scalability? Because it's like one copy of the blockchain can be actually held in multiple computers. Then uh, the second question I wanted to ask is, um, can blockchains be used for daily transactions? Uh, can you use blockchains for every like on, on a daily basis because uh, the way it's uh, very decoupled in nature and then another question that uh, I mean it's it's decentralized in nature so that's why I was asking whether you can be able to use it like on daily uh, transactions then the last question I wanted to ask is uh, are there any like universal standards when it comes to the programmers because it's like every component of the blockchain is unique in its own way. So uh, there is a way that uh, it can make it quite hard uh, when programmers are trying to develop like even coding standards 
uh, that they can use just for the environments and all that. Uh, let me post the question so that it can be helpful. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, it's a good resume. So uh, let's uh, go step by step. And uh, please, uh, Martin, uh, uh, tell me something if I miss uh, or I forget to answer to some of these questions. So can uh, uh, the blockchain be used for daily based transaction? Yes. Uh, this infrastructure is, uh, uh, has been built, Algorand has been built to handle everyday financial activities of humankind. So daily transaction to pay uh, for your food, to transfer value for your family uh, abroad, uh, to invest your money in a tokenized asset, uh, to represent financial uh, instrument to tokenize real estate. So there is no limit to the capability of daily usage in transaction on, on algorithm, especially in those countries where transacting is hard due to the lack of a reliable infrastructure for payments, for example, or for remittances or so on. So this was a question. The other question is handling uh, what that makes life its daily transaction? No, uh, Algorand can uh, now process 1,000 transactions per second. It's going to scale up to 10,000 transactions per, per second. So uh, we are going near to the average transaction per second that global uh, card system today process for daily transaction. So uh, it's not uh, going to slow down the chain. Uh, has been built to sustain this kind of volume. Uh, how does it handle the issue of scalability? Uh, so, scalability problem is uh, can you uh, scale up uh, in the sense that you can process uh, thousands and thousands of transactions per second among billion and billion of users? This is the scalability problem in a blockchain. And the answer is uh, the evidence that I give you about the results of Algorand uh, speaks almost for themselves uh, in terms of scalability. You can finalize, uh, instantly finalize transaction in few seconds uh, among billions or uh, millions or billions of accounts. So uh, this is how we handle the scalability problem. Um, standards about programming. Okay, uh, blockchain space is relatively new. This lecture was a theoretical introduction to blockchain. We are going to see more stuff, hands on stuff for programmers the next time. Uh, but the, the answer is Algorand has built all the tools to let the development experience be easy. So, for example, on Algorand, you can have, a, I use Python, so you can use a Python SDK uh, to create transaction, sign transaction, create uh, new accounts, uh, submitting application call to smart contract, or even programming a smart contract in Python. So, uh, this is something that we are going to see in the next time, uh, when we focus more on development tools uh, and yeah, Algorand uh, put a lot of effort in, uh, in simplifying the uh, development experience. Just because uh, you just if I may add just one probably maybe confusion that could be is that because the block creation takes 4.5 seconds while we talk about transaction, 10,000 transactions per second, maybe just you can elucidate what does it mean? You know, normally also um, in a normal actual transactions, verification versus it's kind of like uh, checking whether the account has a certain amount so that you know you can accept things like that might might be the issue. So just can you explain what does it mean block yeah. creation versus you know ten thousand transactions per second? Yeah. So the uh, the block is this entity in which you can put several. Uh, transaction. So uh, in Algorand today, the block 
contain an average of 5,000 transactions, more or less. This block is uh, this. These blocks could be generating could be generated in each and every 4.5 seconds. So if you take into account 5,000 transactions per block, with a block that is produced uh, in four second, 4.5 seconds, this gives you roughly a bit more than 1,000 transactions processed per second on on uh, on average. So this that does not mean that the effect of a transaction is in one second. So if I send something to a room, uh, it will take four seconds to to uh, to him to see that he has re uh, received the token. So the latency of the system is 4.5 seconds and is going to be reduced to 2.5 seconds in this year. Uh, but in this 2.5 seconds, Algorand can process thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions so that on average we can handle a throughput of roughly 10,000 transactions per second. Great. Yeah, I think I think it's just this. It's not like the, when the block is created in that block, there could be like the transaction that was sent actually one second ago or half a second ago. So that's that's how like kind of in terms of the statistics or the distribution of the timestamps in that block would. That's what you're talking about, right? Like yeah. So for, for for example, you. Uh, what was uh, so uh, uh, in parallel? Uh, so let, let's think about the example. Everybody in this uh, lecture want to send a transaction in the same second. For example, you take everybody takes the, the phone and send the transaction. These transactions are submitted to the, to the network, and me as one node of, of the uh, of the network, I will listen to all your, the transactions that want to enter in the ledger. So from Arun, for Yabi, for Musa, for Anastasia, for everybody. I say, okay, I heard this bunch of this bunch of transaction. I verify that everything is okay because for example, Arun want to send $10 and he really holds at least $10. And I say, okay, uh, for me, this transaction is good, and all these transactions that, that you propose are good. So I pack them into a block, and I propose the block. So I propose a block with several thousand of transactions that are have been batched together by a block proposal that heard the transaction coming to the network from all nodes. Yeah, great. Yeah, and then there are other questions Arun has asked. Uh, yeah. do, Arun, do you want to say it, or should I read it? Maybe you can ask, maybe you can say. Yeah. Should I say it or do you want to just read yeah, it? Yeah. Maybe yeah. just you can explain it. You I mean, yeah. So the question is maybe a little bit around what happens if uh, nodes stop operating and what's the sort of lower bound? So if Elon Musk stops from building Dogecoin, for example, there's stuff built on Dogecoin. What's, what does the sunsetting of some of these blockchain infrastructures look like? So uh, this has to do with the decentralization of, of, uh, of the infrastructure. So since today we have thousands and thousands of nodes, in the future we expect this to, due to network effect and expansion to grow and scale up. Uh, if uh, single nodes go down, these do not affect anything about the infrastructure though. So uh, this makes the infrastructure really, really uh, uh, resilient, but uh, the resiliency of uh, a blockchain is not uh, a magical thing. It's, it's the is the byproduct of a consensus protocol. So, in uh, uh, to to shut down algorithm, you should shut down internet. Uh, and if you are able to shut down uh, the internet, we have more serious problem than just keeping running algorithm. <laughs> Yeah, and okay, so just for the sake of time, then I'm going to read uh, the rest. So Bakar Bangura asked, can someone interact with Algorand blockchain using MetaMask uh, wallet or is it just Algorand wallets? 
Uh, so uh, there are some uh, integrational development uh, going on uh, with the technology that is called Metamask uh, Snap. It's not in production, it's in test environment, uh, but potentially this is something that Meta is a, a Metamask uh, uh, product. So uh, Algorand can simply be integrated uh, as any other. Blockchain they are going. But today, if you want to have a nice uh, user experience, uh, maybe the Algorand wallet is really, really good because you can, for example, display your NFTs in the wallet, you can sign transaction, it's secure. Great. And so there's one that is kind of, I think I'm just going to reach three of them. Hainok, Abel, and Gazani has asked, but maybe just for the sake of time, you can answer them in, in one go. So one is like, why is forking a concern um, for blockchains? Because he has heard ETH fork from 2016, but he doesn't understand it fully. So um, when you say that Algorand has low, very low probability of fork, what does that mean and what does that imply? And then Abel was saying like how state machines blocks relate to one another. I think you already answered that one, so you could it could be it's much more of elucidating, but um, a lot more of like this how states are. I think you you already mentioned it's by just a hash of the previous uh, one, so we could maybe not spend time. But how do you manage the vulnerability, security issue of blockchains, the rise of scalability and power consumption? Again, that was also more or less said, but you know later you can repeat them uh, as needed. But the one that is probably new question is this. Um, why, why, what is, you know, what does it mean? Very low probability and why is the concern? Okay, so uh, for forking, so we should, uh, uh, first of all, differentiate look at two kinds of forking. So there is a, a soft fork and hard fork. So the hard fork is I, I go into the community and I say, I do not agree with anyone in Algorand, I will just take a, a, new, a new chain and uh, build a new chain. So this is a, an art form. So uh, these are being, uh, so the, the, technology, the technology is permissionless. Uh, you should convince everybody on why you are going to start another algorithm, if algorithm already exists or something like that, or another Ethereum or another Bitcoin. For example, in the case of Ethereum, that was the result of a huge hack a huge problem that happened in that time. So the Ethereum community said, we want to take a snapshot of the system and build another system uh, that eliminates these uh, unfortunate events. This is an art for So you have literally two different networks, two different ledgers, two different communities. You split the people uh, together, all together, okay? Uh, the soft fork is another kind of fork. It's, we are not going to uh, instantiate a new network. We are not going to divide the community. But is the, 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 inf the information itself in within the, the same network that forks. So within the same network, there are some people with a version of the ledger and other people with another version of the ledger, but we are in the same network. This is a soft fork, soft fork which is not the result of a political, let me say, action uh, orchestrated outside the technology. This is the unfortunate event of uh, the technology itself uh, because no, they're not able to coordinate themselves so well or so quickly. So people have different representation of the reality in the same ecosystem, which is really bad because this means that, for example, in, in a version of this ledger, Arun owns the Mona Lisa, and the other version of the ledger, Arun does not own the Mona Lisa. So which is the real ledger? I suppose that one in which Arun does not own the Mona Lisa and, uh, and something like that. Arun is happy. Arun is happy with that. Okay, so you may continue and then uh, uh, we can finalize. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I think we are, this is the time we I had for for today. Next time uh, we are going to 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 focus more on the usage of dev tools, APIs, uh, okay. tokenization, and smart contract. Okay, in that case, then maybe you can answer just maybe just be 
a little bit to elucidate the question or with Abel and Gazain, just much more of on the, you know, how states are chained. Uh, just, just somehow going back to your slide, maybe if that helps and seeing, you know, showing what it means, like the, you know, one, one chain is linked to the other with hash and then also vulnerability security issues uh, on blockchain, maybe you can, from Gazain. Yeah. Uh, so the imagine algorand uh, is a state zero, which is a genesis block, um, or maybe some point uh, in the history of algorand. The state of algorand says, for example, Cosimo has ten token, Arun has the Mona Lisa, uh, the smart contract uh, number uh, one has the, the variable uh, color equal equal to red. This is the state of the system. Now, we want to evolve the state of the system. And in the state of the system, the first transaction says that Arun sends the Mona Lisa to Cosimo uh, and Cosimo calls the smart contract to change the variable color from red to blue. Someone, so Arun proposed this transaction. I propose the transaction to, to change the value of, of, the, of, the, of the smart contract. And someone like Anastasia, that is a node partic in a participation node, a, a block proposer, says, okay, I want to propose the block in which uh, the Mona Lisa is, is transferred from Arun to, to Cosimo, and Cosimo sets the variable color of this, the smart contract from red to blue. Uh, I verified that Arun actually signed the transaction, so it's Arun that is proposing to send the Mona Lisa to Cosimo is not uh, like a, a, a thief. Uh, and I verified that Arun owns really a copy of the Mona Lisa on the ledger, so it's not overspending something that is not have, and something like that. If everything is consistent, these are the inputs to the system to evolve the state of algorithm. So if someone comes after this block and looks at the state of the system, now we'll see that Arun does not own the Mona Lisa anymore because it's belonging to Cosmo because he sent it to me. And if I look at this smart contract, I see the color of the smart contract is now blue, it's not red. So the state of the system has been evolved. Great. I mean, I think yeah, the, the main probably here, the distinction is between a state that is constantly being evolved by every action versus the block, which is basically takes into account all of those. Um, so it, it maybe is like, like, how do you handle, like, is the states uh, require verific, you know, the verification uh, because every transaction or every uh, kind of signal uh, is changing. So how is that structured within the algo brand? Is it like, does it before verification does the states because the the, possi the possibility of the state has changed, but is it kind of like, do you actually change for every transaction, or is it like, you know, how is the sequence uh, like? Because I assume like it's random that you say like all the transactions from a transaction pool, right? So you have all a transaction tra all pool. All the transaction, all the transaction that are in a block has an uh, have an impact on the state of the ledger of the state of the of the distributed uh, system. So the inputs that change the state from zero to one is the block. So we have state zero, we have a block with a bunch of transaction that acts on the state, and then we end up being uh, in, on the state one. So if the transaction that is the input to the change of the state in the system are acceptable, are respect, the rule of the game, the system will move from zero to one, from red to blue, from Mona Lisa being in our own state to uh, balance to Mona Lisa being in the Cosmo balance sheet. So this is the, the machine is always the same, but the state of this machine is modified by becoming blocks, which are a set of them transaction verified by the consensus protocol. Okay, just again for me, I'm sorry like to take time, but so are we referring the state being the machine itself, the whole thing, like, or are we referring to the individual states of the accounts that are hold 
So is, is this S0, S1, is this like the zero one, is it the block that we're talking about? Or like, because, it, or is it like, of course, when I say a block, you're saying like the state of, you know, five blocks from Genesis to five blocks versus the state of the blockchain, when you add one, it's changed, right? So like now you have like the state contains six blocks. So what are we referring by this zero one one? Is it just the entire blockchain, the state? Like as just, let's say S, S1 means, let's imagine now the blockchain contains two blocks, the Genesis block and then whatever. And S million means like the, you know, the this state means a blockchain which contains an algorithm blockchain which contains a million uh, blocks. Are we referring that? Uh, uh, we're referring so this you can see the state as the set of the all the balance sheet of the accounts, all the variables of the of the uh, smart contracts. So uh, the snapshot of the final version of of, uh, of the ledger. So if if I take all the balance the balance sheets, Cosimo, Arun, Anastasia, Yabet you will have the state of the accounts. Then you, if you take all the, the, the smart contracts that have some memory, you can take a snapshot of the memory of the smart contract. This conjun conjunction is the state of the machine, is the state of the ledger. Okay. Now, how we arrived here, uh, you can inspect these into the blocks. So each block that is added, modify the, 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 the latest version of the, of the of the ledger. So if someone who does not know what happened in the past, see the ledger, I see, okay, Mona Lisa belongs to Cosimo because in account, it's in the algorithm in the Cosimo account, this smart contract is, is blue, okay. If you want to know how we arrived here, we have a chain of information that since the beginning of the ecosystem brought us here. So this is, uh, I don't know if it's, Explain. Yeah, great. I think, I think, okay. So I think one, like two, and then we close is just that this vulnerability security, uh, you can talk about just in, in Algorand sense, like, so, uh, what are the, like, I'm just modifying it maybe, um, just so that it, it, it makes much more talking point is, you know, how vulnerable and the kind of like, what, what would be the issues? that are related to Algorand in that sense. And then one uh, question from Ten Academy team is that, is there any requirement limitation on accessing or using Algorand's development, developer portal? Okay. And with that we can close. Okay, so uh, on security, uh, I tried to give you uh, uh, an, an idea uh, on why it's very secure. Uh, uh, so why Algorand is very secure because a malicious adversary that wants to attack a node uh, to maybe put down a, a node or, or corrupt a block proposer or tamper with a block proposer simply cannot know in advance who he should corrupt because nobody knows who is going to win the election as a block proposer that uh, uses that verifiable random function in parallel in the secrets of your own hardware until you reveal yourself with the solution and with the block that you propose. So the security is ensured by the fact that I, by no means, I can know I, uh, who I should attack on the, on the network, okay? And uh, this is very, this is very uh, powerful. Uh, and this is independent by the number of nodes that we have, this is independent. Uh, so there are not, uh, it's not the fact that we have many, many nodes that we uh, uh, can less secure, but on the contrary. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the more uh, the nodes, the, the more the network is resilient and the security of the network is ensured by these very strong properties of the verifiable random function, which is the, very pri the, the primitive that solves the algorithm consensus. And uh, the other question, is there any requirements for accessing the, del the developer portal? No, it's everything is public, it's open source, uh, it's an open book, uh, you can go there 
and access to all the contents that you want. Great, I think, I think there are some questions, but I think let's stop there um, just for the sake of time. So we, c we can answer them next time. Um, so yeah. thank you so much, Cosimo. And it was really, like, you know, the questions being coming shows that everybody is excited and understood uh, the questions themselves shows that. So thank you so much again, and then we will arrange the next one where we talk, where you will talk. Um, more of the detail and the implementation. Sure. Thanks you for thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, thanks a lot. See Thank you next you. time. Cheers. See you. Bye guys. Bye.